Welcome into the Tech Ed Podcast. My name is Matt Kirkner. I am your host this week and every single week. We are going deep on artificial intelligence. In this particular episode, we are recording this episode live before a live audience in Waukesha, Wisconsin, and we are doing this at the Wow Works Winning with Wisconsin's Workforce AI event panel. So we have assembled a group of subject matter experts in artificial intelligence across multiple sectors of our economy as we learn about how artificial intelligence is transforming the world here in the state of Wisconsin and around the globe. It is my great pleasure at this time to introduce our four panelists. Number one is Dr. Brian Kay, who serves as Chief Strategy Officer for Rogers Behavioral Health, working closely with executive leadership to define and implement new operational strategies with extensive expertise in data analytics, process improvement, and machine learning algorithms. Next to Brian is George Forge, who is the Senior Vice President of Client Technology and Product Development at Quad. George is responsible for crafting Quad's strategy to identify, build, and deploy industry-leading marketing solutions. He also oversees Quad's research, development, and implementation of artificial intelligence across Quad's offering. Next is Nathan Losansky. He is the Chief Technology Officer at Concurrency, a leading consulting partner for data, AI, security, and digital operations in the Midwest. Nathan is a 14-time Microsoft MVP. He's also a three-time Ironman completer, as I learned this morning, and he serves on several boards. Last but certainly not least is Sarah Grooms, and Sarah serves as the Chief Administrative Officer of Banking Strategies at Wintrust. Sarah leads a wide variety of special initiatives to support strategic priorities across the company, especially those involving innovative technologies and solutions in the highly regulated world of finance. We are going to have a really lively conversation with these folks, so thank you so much for being a part of this panel. As a way of introducing our panelists to the audience and learning a little bit about their organizations, and I'm going to start with Brian and we'll move across the stage. Can you share with us a little bit about your organization, your role, Brian, and where you are on your AI journey? And then before you're done, I also want to know what are your three go-to AI apps that are loaded up on your smartphone and you can't answer ChatGPT? Excellent questions. And uh, thank you, Matt, for having us. So Rogers Behavioral Health, we're located out in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. We've been there for 117 years. Uh, and over the years, Rogers has grown quite dramatically. So we are the largest non-for-profit, non-affiliated behavioral health institution in the U.S. We see close to 25,000 patients a year come through our doors, uh, and we're located in 10 different states now. Behavioral health has always been steeped kind of in the art of therapy. What we're trying to do is how do we move it from the art to the science, and AI is an excellent way of being able to do so. So we're mining a lot of our data sets to provide more personalized medicine. How do we build efficiency into our workflows? And as well as how do we reduce administrative burden or clinical burden with our therapists? So I could speak about a few of those later. The three apps that I got loaded up, personal favorite is one called Cleft, which is a transcription app that gives you markdown style notes. So when I'm driving in the car, it's fantastic. A gimme app is Google Assistant. I have my home all smart automated. And then the last one is called Research Rabbit. So if you need to look at anything for peer-reviewed publications, it's a great way to start. Research Rabbit, that's a new one to me. And Brian, I should also mention, as a former guest on the Tech Ed Podcast, and I'm surprised you didn't have that right in your bio, but uh, that episode was <laughs> was absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. We'll move now to George Forge of Quad. George, same question. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm George Forge. I'm from Quad. You guys are probably familiar with Quad or just down the street, one of the largest employers in the area and in the state. Um, you probably know us as a manufacturer. We grew up as a manufacturing company, a 53-year-old company. My timing was perfect. So I started with the company just shy of 20 years ago, and the company has been on a transformative journey for the majority of that time. Um, we're actually now the 14th largest marketing agency in the world, and uh, we've been on that transformational journey. The short version of it is you know, print is a form of media, and as that form of media obviously had some organic declines and challenges globally, you know, we got on that bandwagon and, and pretty aggressively diversified our offering. So um, in terms of favorite apps, my first one is Perplexity. Love it. If you find yourself like we probably all do, 
Googling stuff, I would submit to you that it is a far better Google um, because it will answer your question as opposed to give you a bunch of paid search responses. It will actually answer the question directly, similar to a chat GPT, but importantly, it will index the sources of the answers. So that is a phenomenal tool that kind of takes out some of the guesswork that a lot of AI platforms will give you. Second, from a media perspective, MidJourney uh, is phenomenal from a content standpoint. There's some, some challenges there in the legal space, but I'm not going to get into that. And then the last one that we've been playing with a lot is called Cassidy. So Cassidy, um, as you know, we're a big company, we have 13,000 employees, and there's just many different types of employees. But if you kind of take each piece and you say, okay, what is the content that these employees are constantly interacting with? How do we make that more accessible? Um, one of the classic examples for us is RFP responses. So we've got about 2,900 uh, clients. We work across tons of different industries. And so how do you build an AI assistant that can help give the best answers for that particular industry that are current and relevant and, and need minimal, minimal people? Um, that frankly takes a ton of our time as senior leaders to make sure that those RFPs are, are right. So it sounds trivial, but to your earlier point, it just kind of you know, efficiency in your day to day. It's, it's a phenomenal tool. Absolutely. By the way, I just used perplexity last week and I asked it, where in Walgreens do I find the rubbing alcohol? And it was like, it literally pointed me to the shelf. I mean, right yeah. to it. So absolutely, absolutely love that particular app. Uh, Nathan, same question for you. Tell us a little bit about concurrency. Where are you in your AI journey? And then what are those go-to apps? Sure thing. Good morning, everybody. I'm Nathan Lesnoski. I'm concurrency CTO. We make AI real in companies. So we help companies to be able to translate the mission of their organization into a mission that's enabled by AI. We've been, been around for about 30 years. So I spend most of my time helping organizations to look at the mission of their business and think about how it translates into leveraging AI to be able to make that real in the mission and help them to be able to gain new revenue or operational savings or better customer results as, uh, as a, with AI as an asset. So it's really, really interesting right now because most organizations don't know where to go with AI. Their executive teams know it's a thing. They know they're interested in it. They know it has to be an asset for them in the future, but they're not sure what to do with it. And we have the great blessing in being able to help those organizations take advantage of AI in a responsible, but also assertive way. One of my favorite apps, boy, um, I'd say Copilot is probably the one I use the most often. In particular, the game-changing component of that for me has been meaning transcription. Just not having to take notes in meetings and being able to ask it aspects of the meeting has been just amazing for me. Like I, I wasn't a note taker in the first place and there was always someone who had to take notes in meetings. There was always that like job that kept them from being able to be engaged. And for me now, that discipline of turning it on and then enabling that and even sending it to people afterward has been, has been awesome. The second thing is training peaks. So if anyone is an athlete and they want to be very, data-driven in how they compare themselves against uh, how they can get better at their particular sport. For me, I had just done a bunch of triathlons and Training Peaks was an asset for me to be able to say, where where do I score against my competitors and how can I get better at different aspects of my training regimen? Like when should I work out more? When should I work out less? Um, and then the third, and this has been fun, this has been one that's been around for a while, is uh, this plant identifier on, on my iPhone. I love it because I've got all these these different plants in the backyard and I don't know which are good plants and which are bad plants. My kids know, but I don't. So I'll go up to it and scan it and it'll tell me what I should be taking out with my, uh, my uh, tools and what I shouldn't be taking out. Love that. And I'll also mention that Nathan is a prolific public speaker in Keen Orders. I know you wouldn't plug that for yourself. I'll plug it for you. He does a wonderful, wonderful job. So Sarah, take us home on this, on this question. Tell us about your AI journey, what you're up to at Wintrust and then the, the, the go-to apps. Good morning, everybody. I It's interesting, you know, and Brian will probably tag into this too, but being part of a regulated, very, very highly regulated industry is a little bit different um, in terms of what we can do, especially depending on the size of the company. So Wintrust Financial Corporation has been around for over 30 years. So we're actually a big amalgamation of uh, like kind of a financial services holding company. So if it's if it's financial services, we probably have something to do with it either here or in Canada. And um, the, the state of AI at Wintrust is really interesting because we have to take a really regulated and measured approach, especially from a data perspective, privacy perspective, and so on and so forth. And so we'll get into that quite a bit. Um, my favorite apps, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of a geek when it comes to um, images. I love photography and art and all of that kind of stuff. So one of my favorites is actually Lenza, and it uh, lets me wipe out 
things that are in the background. So if I, you know, take a picture and it's like finally both kids are looking and smiling and there's some random over here, you know, they can just wipe that person out. And I've done that quite a bit. I like Copilot too, and that feels like stealing. But the reason I like it is actually not at the work front version, but actually if you go in the app, very similarly, if you're trying to say, oh, I don't know, design a tattoo, you can kind of give it prompts and start seeing images and start watching it change and 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 add things to it and everything else. And so if you're, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I have all these vivid imaginations, but I'm a terrible artist myself. And so I can start telling it what I want something to look like and then give that, you know, to say a tattoo artist or to marketing or to, you know, whatever. It's like, here, this is what I want this to look like. And then um, similar on the transcription services, I use a, I use one called Plaud, P-L-A-U-D, and it actually will take the, it listens to a meeting or does whatever or phone conversation or whatever you're trying to be like, no, I really want to capture what we're talking about here so that we can then bullet back and then send it back to people. And so depending on the, if it's not a work thing and Copilot's not available, Plaud's another really good one. Perfect. So now you've got 11 new apps because we had Copilot twice that you can download on your smartphone and, and get going on your AI journey. And so those were really, really good examples. And thank you to our panelists for the answers to those questions. We're going to move into general and use cases for artificial intelligence. I've got actually a different question from, for each of our panelists on this particular topic. I'm going to begin this series with Brian once again. Dr. Brian Kay, have you used artificial intelligence to solve a problem that you would not have been able to solve without artificial intelligence? And also would love to hear if you've got some of those distant early warning signs that one of your AI projects is, is going off, off the uh, rails and needing to start over. Yeah, excellent question. So part of our business, we have close to 225 beds of called residential level of care. This is intensive behavioral health services where frankly people from all over the country come and seek our services. 60% of the patients who are on that campus are from out of state of Wisconsin. So it's a significant time investment and their typical length of stay is 30 to 70 days. Uh, so they're taking time out of their lives, they're traveling cross country. One of the most important things is how do we create treatment plans that are very personalized and set up so they have the best possible treatment response. A few years ago, we set it up first as a research study. So going through our institutional review board, since we are such a regulated industry uh, of saying, if we could apply artificial intelligence and especially deep learning algorithms, on day number one, can we predict if an individual is going to respond to treatment? And if they're not going to respond to treatment, what are the different levers that we need to pull as clinicians in the treatment team to make sure that they have the best possible outcomes? By setting up those algorithms and leveraging different data from patient-reported outcome measures, we had a positive predictive value of around 92%. So what that means is basically 92% accuracy, we were able to predict if that individual was going to respond to treatment on their first day. If they weren't, we were identifying 40% of patients who fall into the not in response category. Of the 40%, by identifying what levers we were able to pull, an additional 80% responded to treatment. So it would not have been possible if we didn't employ the use of AI because there's so many different variables and so many different correlations underlying in the data that a human wouldn't be able to do so. And when you think of the amount of data that's collected in the medical record on someone's treatment stay, it is astronomical. So the, a pure human putting it all together is just not possible, but having AI as a tool to assist our clinicians have been a phenomenal uh, aspect to do so. In terms of warning signs, how we set up all of our AI governance, we have a board that mirrors the same composition of an institutional review board. So we have different disciplines. We have actually a lay person on that board who has no idea what AI is, and they could provide some different ethical perspectives. And then we review our projects based on our evaluation metrics at a very consistent standpoint. So we want to understand how is the positive predictive value? What is some of the qualitative data coming from our clinicians? So we're always looking at it and making sure that we're on top of it. Especially with so much focus around mental health these days, the ability to use data, to use AI to improve the quality of care is just a great example, Brian. So thank you. I want to move on to George Forge from Quad. What are some of your early wins with artificial intelligence? Yeah, sure. So one of the great opportunities that we had, and Becky Hilapa, who is our AI business unit champion for our operations team, is actually here. We've been collecting data on our equipment for decades. And, you know, in a world where it's really hard to get that talent and in an industry that sometimes some of our assets have useful lives of 15, 20 years at sure. times, right? So 
you know, how do you tap into the expertise of someone who may have fixed that piece of equipment super efficiently, but they were a 40 year employee and they're since retired. So, you know, that was a really great opportunity for us to tap into that data. And it's called uh, maintenance GPT, I think it is. is and, uh, you know, it's just amazing that, you know, you think about a community that frankly, you know, are maybe not as welcoming to the technology, but they're finding that, hey, if I can just go here and I can ask a question and I can get the knowledge of the dozens of people who have fixed this piece of equipment in the past, and then I can do my job more efficiently. So it's, it's super helpful from a training perspective. You know, at the end of the day, we measure our equipment on uptime. And so there's, you know, there's incentives built into to use the technology as well. We subsequently did a very similar thing that's not quite ready for prime time yet, but we're testing with our safety data as well. So similarly, decades of safety data that's highly regional. It's highly subjective on weather conditions, just other patterns of geopolitical things that may happen in that region. So how do we bring all that information together and get that information to our leaders as efficiently as possible? And then what's really cool is once you identify the things that are most likely to occur, creating preventative measures on the fly is so easy. And then on top of that, we have you know dozens of different languages that are spoken across uh, our global platform. So Polish, Spanish, there's many different dialects of Spanish, right? So our leader of Europe, for example, is from Provence, right? Huh. So his Provencal French is very different from other areas. You know, it's very different from Canadian French. So sure. like, how do you pick that up dynamically and build these things just super efficiently? So that, that's been a huge win. Looking more, you know, forward looking towards, you know, where Quad is going versus where we've been a little more on the marketing services side. Our primary differentiator is that we're an integrated media company. And that's not very common in the, in the media industry. What I mean by that is there's usually different agencies that take just a portion of your media spend. So there might be one company that just does social media, another that just does search, another that just does out-of-home media, another that just does print media. We do it all. And that's a great opportunity for us to use data to say, okay, how do we uh, you know, look at a marketer's goals and how do we understand what media mix is going to be most effective either at a regional level or at an individual level. We've got tons of data to support that, um, which we think is a big differentiator. It helps us create better content that's more strategic, that's faster, and frankly, it's cheaper as well. Awesome answer. And it is interesting, the convergence between you know, my world of manufacturing, you know, your world of media, and how much commonality there are in the application. So I, I really enjoyed that. It's all about taking inefficiency out of the equation. And that's you know something Quad has done for decades, and we've been able to kind of take that, that knowledge into the marketing space. Absolutely. So, so Nathan, and as much as there are a lot of commonalities in certain industries, there's differences too. So are you seeing certain differences in the application of AI in your specific market space? Well, it's interesting. There's there's so much that's in common, maybe right. not even necessarily in difference. I, th I think one of the most things that's in common is that people are able to leverage AI to learn about themselves. An example of that would be, I'll stick in manufacturing, but this, is, this fits in professional services and other spaces too, which is understanding the needs of your business from the market and then being able to translate that into whether it's inventory or staffing or skills and being able to translate that into the loads of that you have in order to produce your goods. So for example, we worked with a company in Chicago, it's about a billion dollar company, and they were able to optimize their inventory holdings by about $40 million year over year, simply by knowing more about what the demand was from their customers by building AI models around it. But what I really think is interesting about this is that once you know more about yourselves, you start to know more about your customers and your customer's customer. So what companies like that can then do is they can translate that understanding into a conversation with their customer about their strategic needs. So in this case, it's about, I know more about your demand needs than you know about your own demand needs. And I can form a, real, a partnership with you to help serve you better. But some organizations are taking it a step further. They start to understand the picture of their customers. So working with a global restaurant provider of uh, food services, and one of the things they started to figure out about their customers is what makes a successful restaurant? Why does a restaurant stay in business and why doesn't a restaurant stay in business? Well, who knows more than the food providers? Who knows more than who's delivering that every single day as to why those restaurants are staying in business? Well, they start to get to a position where they're not only delivering that low margin service of the individual product they're delivering, but they become a knowledge broker to their customer and they can provide now layered on premium best practice services to say, this is what the top quartile is doing in your market. 
This is what makes them special against your competitors. And that translates into almost any industry. So understanding more about yourself allows you to translate that into understanding your customers and what your customer's customer wants from that organization that you're serving, helping them to be more successful. Ultimately, that is what every business is trying to do, is make our customers more successful at serving their customers. So AI really enables the mission of every organization to be able to be more successful. If we look at it through the lens of what makes every organization unique and special, and allow that to translate into leveraging technology to make that true. And that's what's really made this an exciting time. You know, what I love about that answer, Nathan, is you're, you're talking about what specific insight do you have given your specific place in the market that maybe nobody else has? How do you build the data set and then use AI to predict things for your customers and, and add value in ways that we've, we've never been able to before? I really, really like that. 100%, yeah. We will be back to this week's episode in just a moment. But before we continue, I have to tell you where I will be in early December. ACTE's Career Tech Vision happens this December 4th through the 7th at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center located in the heart of San Antonio, Texas, along the banks of the beautiful Riverwalk. Vision is the largest annual conference in the nation for career and technical education professionals and offers you opportunities to gather with your peers and grow professionally, expand your professional development, and ignite your inspiration. There is still time to register. Visit careertechvision.com to learn more about this premier event. And now back to this week's episode. All right. So, Sarah, I know Wintrust is kind of at the, the early stages of your, your AI journey. And one of the reasons that I love having you up here is that that's where most of us are, right? Most of us are are just starting to figure this out, just getting going. And so I think you have a really, really unique perspective for our audience. So as you're starting that AI implementation journey at Wintrust, are you just like jumping right into projects? Love the softball. Thanks so much. No, we can't just start jumping into projects. Although it's interesting, got to speak at another event for Nate last week, and it was it was interesting at where everyone is in the journey and understanding not only where you are, but where, you know, you just talked about your customers' customers. How about your vendors? And so you might not actually realize how much AI you are already using because of the folks you're using, right? So, you know, you you might not have anything going on internally, like in a lab or in a, you know, fun little innovation group or anything else. But think about all of the folks that you are leveraging, right? So if you're, a, if you've got a CRM, you know, a Salesforce, a, you know, one of those and things like that, that's, there's just AI everywhere in that. And it's leveraging your data and it's potentially giving your salespeople recommendations of how to approach their customers or their prospects or what have you. It's all built into all of the Microsoft apps. Now, if you don't automatically shut it off, it's on. And so it's there, right? And so what we needed to do was not only take a look at, you know, where is that from a vendor perspective and our partners and everything and how they're leveraging it, but also then are we sort of inadvertently using it and not even realizing it? Does that affect our customers? Is it affecting our employees? And so I think that, you know, one of the really, you know, um, good points too that a couple people have sort of referenced, but I'll really be explicit about it, is where are those opportunities for your employees to start leveraging it and, you know, in a way that's not going to scare them? And so that's another way that we're looking at it as well. Like, but we're not going to just jump in and suddenly have like, you know, some sort of AI algorithm robo advising our entire client base on their financial investments. Like that is not where we start, right? Where we would we need to start, first of all, from regulated perspective is policies, procedures, um, standing up potentially a center of excellence, uh, similar to the review board that Brian was talking about, where you have people looking at all the different aspects and things like that of um, how that might impact you. And particularly, how are those, and I forget which app it was that you said that actually gives you the references. Perplexity app, that's huge. So to me, anything that we're going to do in the AI space, once we really actually start turning things on and, and, and leveraging that, is you have to be able to go back and say, where did this information come from? The transparency of it is going to be crucial, I think, in every industry and in every application, but in particularly in regulated industries, because we're going to have to answer for, okay, how did you make that recommendation, right? So at some point, if we're going to say here, for, you know, for me, I, you know, I chose to put a new branch in this town and I chose that corner, right? Well, how if, if I use any AI and there's all sorts of applications we're evaluating, I'm looking at different vendors right now that have all this different data, right? It's cell phone pings and it's, you know, everything, every little piece that's going to drive these algorithms and then be prescriptive, be predictive about like, this is where we think you should be next. If I'm going to actually leverage something like that, 
And as the human then look at the look at the recommendations and choose one that's recommended by something that's completely, you know, artificial based on data from outside and inside, I'm going to then have to at some point say, okay, here's why. And here's all of the information that created that recommendation. So the transparency is going to be crucial. And so that's the, those are the other things that we're going to be looking for as we evaluate, like, where and how are we going to use this? And then we're going to be able to, I my personal opinion is that you're going to have to start internal. So how are you going to leverage things to make the employees' lives easier, right? Because a happy employee is going to create happy customers. And then how are you going to do it maybe in a way that like, yes, it's customer facing. So think of like a call center, right? Or something like that. How many people have ever called a call center and got an answer you didn't like and then hung up and called back and got a different answer, Mm -hmm. right? And maybe that answer was even worse. Thank you for the hand. Um, And so, right, maybe that was worse, but maybe it was better. And usually worse and better are just depending on what your problem is and did they solve your problem, right? And if you feel treated fairly and if you feel like you got a, you got a good response, well, we can go from, you know, maybe just using it to help employees onboard easier and, you know, auto enroll in a 401k or something, something personal, something internal to then helping those employees when they are servicing a customer. Maybe it's already working in the background to, you know, scan all of the policies and procedures and everything that these people are talking about and say, here is the right answer. And now you have consistency and you have actual correct answers going out to people. And then maybe you get into, you know, the robo stuff and everything that's like, okay, this is that next best solution for you, or this is that next best answer. Actually, I think that you don't, you aren't going to want a, you know, a 30 year mortgage. You might want a five year arm right now or something because of X, Y, and Z. And here's why we think that. And I think that the empowerment that can come out of that to help people win with money, which is my personal ethos is, you know, democratization of data and winning with money for everybody. I think that that's where we're going to see the most lift from a customer perspective. So those are just Sarah answers right now. It starts with the data and the governance and all the rest of it, but I think it'll all come together and coalesce at the right pace for our company. So many different applications, and and I love the whole idea of helping people win with money and the fact that you've got a personal mission attached to the work that you're doing as you you go through this AI journey, which is going to be really, really fascinating to follow. I know, George, one of the things that's been fascinating to follow in the world of artificial intelligence is kind of looking back in the past. I grew up in a world where our manufacturing plants, for instance, were air-gapped, all the data stayed inside. And now everything's connected. Everything, you know, everything is censored. We're pulling all this data. Do you worry a little bit about IP and how we keep that safe? And, and how is Quad thinking about that? Yeah, it's a great question. We still have air gaps, but yes. So yeah, at that point, I mean, when you look at a company like Quad, thirteen thousand employees, we service about three thousand B two B clients. We reach every household, give or take, uh, in the country. We've got a ton of data. We also have a lot of different personas within our organization. So. What we did, um, you know, really ChatGPT was the catalyst. Uh, I think it kind of woke all of us up a little bit, you know. So as we came into January of 2023, you know, kind of post-holiday and us all kind of seeing the impact of ChatGPT and and what was to come, we knew that we needed to create a steering committee. Sounds like very similar to my peers here. You know, we were very thoughtful about making sure that we had representation from every area of the business. That was key. So that was the starting point. We also have a top level steering committee Then we have AI business unit champions that's representative of every area. And then we kind of broke down and said like, what type of data are we dealing with? We have employee data, we have customer data, and we have quad confidential data, right? So we have to kind of go from there and then we have to kind of look at that intersection of roles. So which roles are intersecting with what type of data and how do you put logical securities around those things? So you know, we deal, you know, with financial services, we deal with healthcare companies. And the answer there is number one, you know, it needs to be completely segregated and it needs to be completely containerized and it cannot get into an AI model in any way, shape or form. Then we also deal with, you know, brands who are trying to sell t-shirts and hats and they're like, how do we get our data into a generative model so that I can create 50 different iterations to reach my market? And I think that over time, the more regulated industries will be leaning into that. And I'm not being critical. It's absolutely what needs to be done. But I think it's a huge challenge for Quad because we have to really be thinking about what's the role of the individual? What's the type of customer that we're serving? What is the type of product that we're serving for that customer? So it's by far not a one size fits all. Um, I'm really proud of what we built. It's not perfect, but um, I think the it started with creating you know, kind of a, you know, a, a North star that goes all the way up to our senior leadership. And then it can't, and then really, I think where the rubber meets the road is having business leaders that have the knowledge of how AI may affect their space, 
and making sure that we're all, I think you said it very well, like there's so many commonalities even within our company. And then you look out in the world, you're like, okay, this is how we need to be thinking about data protection and security. And it'll morph, you know, the, the leading edge marketers that have a little bit higher risk tolerance, you know, as that starts to harden for the world and for the legal community, um, then some of the more regulated spaces will, you know, I, I think start to lean in even further than they have. Lots of things yet to be figured out in the world of artificial intelligence. But as George talks about uh, regulated industries, uh, Brian, you're, I don't think your industry is regulated at all, right? Healthcare, not really. So, um, I, And I know this is something you deal with every single day. So I just want to turn a similar question to you. What data privacy concerns is healthcare starting to work through as you implement artificial intelligence? There's a lot. And similar to George, we've spent a lot of time on that identity access management piece. So who could access what data is absolutely critical. But there's some interesting bends that's going on in healthcare right now. Uh, cybersecurity, we are going through an absolute, I, I mean, it's unbelievable what's happening. Attacks on hospitals in the last year have gone up 300%. Uh, so there are cyber criminals that are going at, to all these different hospitals around the US to try, get, try to get ransomware. So we spent a tremendous amount of time making sure that we migrated our data to the cloud. We're using best breed Microsoft Azure to ensure we've got all the security protections in place. The other piece with uh, data privacy and healthcare is if you're applying artificial intelligence algorithms, ensuring you don't have bias in your underlying data sets. Rogers, we see a specific population that comes into our doors. We have chosen deliberately not to make the move of monetizing algorithms or doing anything along those lines. A, because the algorithms have learned off of our patient population. And would it be able to have the same amount of accuracy in different places? We don't know. And we don't want to take that risk. In B, in healthcare, every piece of data that you collect is someone's story. It's someone's personal information. It's someone being vulnerable. It's someone coming into care. We treat that with the utmost respect that we want to use it to make sure that it's helping them on their journey of recovery rather than doing things of mining information or uh, maximizing revenue or things along those lines. So we just take it on a small little bend from that personal level, level as well as just the privacy uh, yeah, security side. Absolutely. And as someone like all of us who accesses the healthcare system, thank you for the care that you're using in terms of, of using our data. That's obviously really, really important to all of us as we think about artificial intelligence, we think about regulation, and we think about policies that organizations should be considering as they implement their AI journey. So Sarah, you mentioned earlier, just thinking through some of the policies uh, around employees, around how you're handling customer data. So so what policies are you developing at Wintrust and what fun, foundational elements are you considering as you move forward? Sure. So I think I might have mentioned that we're considering or, or planning on standing up a center of excellence. And so for those who are maybe unfamiliar with the term, basically you have a, a group of people dedicated not to AI in any specific segment of the company or of the businesses or or that sort of thing, but like this is what they do. So these are AI experts. They do understand, in our case, financial services, privacy, security, all of the all of the aspects that we need to to look at, so that as business cases come up, they can not only help us implement, but also kind of help us potentially, hopefully, with you know ROI and stack ranking, what the opportunities are. Because here's the thing: the opportunities are going to be endless. Anything to do to me with technology is only limited by our own human imagination, right? And so, like, it's kind of like a shoot for the stars, land on the moon perspective that I always have. It's like, what else could we do with this, right? If we weren't scared, if we weren't limited and that sort of thing. And then where do we start, right? Because I'm a big kind of, I, I always say, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to throw a lot of juxtapositions at you and cognitive dissonance, but I'm both a, you know, begin with the end in mind and roadmap it out and dream big. And also don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Don't let, don't let something be the enemy of nothing, right? And like, just get going, do something, start somewhere. And so as we look at standing up both this group to help implement all of the governance and all of the policies around, like I said, transparency and accuracy and, you know, just being fully everything fully documented. And I mean, I mean, fully documented. <laughs> you can't really understand model risk management until you've been through it. But um, once you have all of that in place, then to me, the, the best opportunities are going to come from the front line. And so somebody that is frustrated with the way that they have something to do every single day, right? So whether it is those you know, we don't want a chat bot. We still want humans doing it. But how do we make sure the humans are, are fully, you know, fully up to date on every single thing that they might get asked every single day? 
you know, how do we layer it in there, right? How do we layer it in around, um, you know, lending and and maybe recovery if something's going wrong? I, Brian, I'd love to talk about what you guys have done in terms of improving that accuracy and the outcomes and like how you plan that. Because I all I could think was, I wonder if there's a way we could take our data, look at every single loan that's ever gone bad and figure out like which aspects really would have mattered so that we could predict when a loan seems like it's going bad, do I have, actually have a chance of recovering this if I restructure it? Or should I just take my first loss because my first loss is always my best loss, right? Like what rules that we've always operated by are just going to get completely upended because now we can actually feed data into something and get a real answer. The possibilities are endless. And so that's why I'm one of those, like, I've always been, a, I always joke that I'm kind of the weirdo. I'm like the change management junkie. I'm like, what else can we change? When can we upend this? How do we transition? How do we get people excited about change? And I'm, I say I'm the weirdo because most people are terrified of change. You know, you might hate the thing you're doing, but you're the best at doing it. People want change but they're scared of the transition. And so I think that by using the right policies, putting the right people in place, having the right leaders, both on the technology side, but more, not, not to say more importantly, Nate, but just as importantly on the business side and having those business champions like George talking about to surface those ideas so that we can kind of figure out, okay, where does this fit? And then roadmap our, uh, the way to the future. This isn't the first time I've said on the Tech Ed podcast, we love weirdos. I feel very at home. Thank you. <laughs> and, I, and I'll also I'll also mention, I love the way a number of our panelists have pointed to these cross-functional teams and talking about having frontline workers as part of the AI journey or the steering committee or the council, making sure this is really cross-functional. I know, Nathan, that's something that's important to you. Tell us a little bit from the IT angle where you spend a lot of time what are two or three things organizations should be doing to prepare their data for the age of AI? I think to a certain extent, you have to think about what problem you're trying to solve before you think about cleansing your data. Sometimes people think about the data problem as a little bit of a boogeyman, like, oh, the data's not ready for AI and it's sort of a get out of jail free card to have to really think about this problem at all. Or it like holds them back from doing, I, I, I really appreciate what you mentioned is like 50% of nothing is still nothing, right? <laughs> You're not going to make progress until you actually try to make progress. So understanding what you're truly trying to achieve starts with the business, starts with the mission of your organization, starts with what you're trying to do to help the business win. And many organizations don't start there. They start with IT as a problem or IT as a data holder that's not really sure how to move itself forward. So the first thing is to understand that prioritize understanding of how your strategy translates into leveraging data to make that real in the context of artificial intelligence or other types of platforms. That's true for both these very narrowly focused AI use cases that many of us have been talking about, as well as very broad commodity use cases, such as like what a co-pilot or something along those lines would apply. You know, we sometimes forget that like one of the biggest impacts that's going to happen in our organizations is every employee leveraging AI to be more every employee being able to take their individual work tasks, the data that they use on a daily basis, whether it's in a database or Excel or Word or PowerPoint or some document from 10 years ago, and leverage that information to be able to perform their activities in a more in a way that allows them to be more effective at their daily work. So what I'm seeing organizations do, absolutely organizing centers of excellence or strategy organizations, however they define that cross-functional team, but it's really trying to understand what are the ways we're going to win as an organization over the next two to three years? How does that relate to our current state? It may be completely different. They may be disrupting their organization to be able to approach the market in a completely different way. So they think about that strategy of the business, then understand what data is going to enable that to be true. Don't think about data in terms of just straight data-driven. Think about it in terms of an objective that you're trying to achieve. What needs to be true from a data perspective, from a staffing, from a skilling, from a project and portfolio standpoint for me to achieve those goals. That then allows me to be able to build a data state that serves that objective as well as the skilling around it. Final point I'll give around the data state, and this is probably an undervalued aspect of AI, is how much AI can enable organizations to find non-intuitive insights from their data. I was working with an organization that was leveraging manufacturing data, and there's a part of their manufacturing process that they didn't understand. Like they're Half the time, it would produce a level of efficiency of the production process that was wildly different than the other half of the process. And they couldn't figure out why that was, but they were able to leverage that that sea of data. I think you mentioned um, you know, so much of this information on our manufacturing, the OT environment is now available to us, or the healthcare environment or other environments that are being able to start being available for us to be able to get sensing and information and experimentation. 
Well, they were able to leverage AI to be able to figure out what is that missing piece? Like what's the missing element that keeps us from being more efficient on a consistent basis across our production process? And that's simply by finding non-intuitive insights from experimentation with AI, not just by automating a process. Sometimes we kind of quickly go to like automating a process is what AI is. Yes, that is, that is a component of AI. The other part of it is using AI to discover something new in partnership with a person's unique skills and capabilities. So data has so much to unlock here, and we're just right at the tip of the iceberg. At the tip of the iceberg, indeed. We are almost at the end of the iceberg for this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. And so, George, I'm going to ask this question of you related to workforce. As we think about upskilling that next generation, what is Quad doing now differently in the age of artificial intelligence to prepare your workforce for the times we're living in? I think that AI is still such a new word. If you're in this room, you probably have a perspective of what it means to you. And I think just getting the word out and showing examples and being really tangible about those examples and showing how it can drive business benefit. I mean, that's kind of where we are, you know, in a broad sense. We have a small number of people in the grand scheme of 13,000. We have a small number of people who are really living this every day. And I think just the world needs more examples. Uh, it's one of my greatest pet peeves. And I uh, will confidently say it didn't occur today where you go to an event and people just say the word over and over and over and over, and they don't really say what the heck they're doing with it. And I just, I'm very critical of that. I'm very dubious of that. And I'm proud that, you know, Quad is taking the time to say, these are some specific things, whether you're on the manufacturing floor or you're an executive or you're a marketing media planner, like here's some real stuff that can make your job easier and more effective. So I think just getting the word out and getting real tangible examples out is key. Thank you, George. Both great examples. And, and Brian, our last uh, general question before our speed round, and I'm actually going to combine two questions. First of all, are you still hearing, our, is AI going to take the jobs away? And what do you tell people when you hear that? And secondly, what scares you most about artificial intelligence? So oddly enough, in behavioral health, we're not hearing that as much anymore. Good. We're actually seeing recruits coming in, especially with our therapists who are having a baseline expectation that AI is in their workflow to help reduce some of the documentation burden that they experience. Wild stat for providers, docs typically work around 11 hours a day. Of those 11 hours, four hours are doing documentation in the medical record. You think when you apply some of these different AI techniques, it's amazing the amount of burden that it could reduce while increasing accuracy and meeting all the documentation expectations in a regulated industry. What I tell people, first off, AI is here to augment your job. It's helping there to reach your full potential or work at the top of your license. B, everybody associates AI, I think, in this space today with chat GPT. AI is actually very old. I mean, it, you could actually accredit it back to Alan Turing in 1940s. What has actually happened the last five years is this increases computing power, cloud computing, and it's just kind of reached a little bit of a plethora uh, that it hasn't been before. But it's not as scary as people may seem, and many of the methods are already there. What scares me the most about AI is people who apply it without understanding what is truly going on in their underlying data. I think everybody takes a shiny object, they apply it, they want to get some sort of nugget or insight out of it, but you truly have to understand your data and you have to understand your domain expertise to do it right. And I, I think especially in the healthcare industry, also having outputs that are actually actionable. I think for healthcare, we should not be doing algorithms just to do algorithms. They should be there that has actually some sort of output that a clinician can actually use to improve health outcomes. So actually having a purpose to the AI, start with the end in mind. And beginning now with our end in mind, we are at the end of this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast, but for one great question, and I know we're going to love the answer to these, this question. We're going to start with Sarah and move, and move across the, uh, the stage. And Sarah, here's the question. In 10 words or less, if you could create any AI app, what would it be? Something to predict the outcomes of really important life events. Love it. Nathan. Customer service automation. Three words. Very well done. George. A business assistant that really delivers on the promise. You know, I think Copilot is great, but there, there's a next level of, of workflow assistant that is, is out there that will, I think, really have a very meaningful impact on, on the, the global workforce. And Brian, bring us home. Matt, I'm going a totally different route. If anybody smokes barbecue, a temperature probe that is very good at predicting when it's going to be done. Important life <laughs> events. I love it. Very good at predicting when it's going to be done. We are all done with this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. 
I want to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Brian Kay, George Forge, Nathan Lesnowski, and Sarah Grooms. Please give them a big round of applause.